Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 17th chapter. This will be different from what our notes are. We're, we're, we'll track with the notes a little bit, but not completely. If I could borrow that for just a moment, Brother Ricky, thank you. On your notes, we, I filled in the great promise and the great commandment and the great commission for you. And then to love God with all your heart is worship, because number three in your notes, this is the universal vision of the Lord. Everybody, every person within the body of Christ is instructed by the Lord to worship him. And my intention this morning was to fill this in because I want to get to mission, which is, I think, number four in your notes. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that soon enough. But, but today, um, I'm struck by the notion uh, that worship cannot be um, an appendage to our ministry. Everything we do must flow out of and come back to worship. For everything flows from his throne and all glory goes back to his throne. This is the way of the kingdom of God. And being a preacher, sometimes you get lost in the notion of of the, the incredible need to proclaim the word, and of course we do, and that's the gospel is at the core of our mission, and we believe that. But as the old Westminster Catechism says, the, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so the chief end of humanity is to give worship and praise and glory uh, to the Lord. So the first part of the, of the universal vision of the Lord for the church, when the lawyer asked Jesus of all the commandments, which is the greatest, which is the most significant, which is the most important, in your notes and on the screen, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus responds, and he said, the greatest commandment, the most important one, let me get to it in my own notes, it'll be on the screen here in a moment, but in Matthew 22, there it goes, thank you, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is, this is the greatest of all the commandments. Everything flows out of this. Everything happens out of that. You can't love your neighbor as yourself unless you're loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So you can't engage in ministry, service, the act of serving, unless you have actively engaged in the act of worshiping. And I, I have a, a, a concern in my spirit today that sometimes we get, we get so um, involved, and maybe it's not you, maybe it's just me, but sometimes I get so involved in the, in the activity of serving, the activity of ministry, the activity of, of the organization, the activity of the campus, the activity of, of various things that we work on and, and, and think about and pray about, and then if I go to speak, I, you know, I'm thinking about that and all of that, that I myself, and maybe you're not this way, but sometimes I forget that none of that activity matters if I'm not giving glory to him. And none of that ministry takes place in true effectiveness and fulfillment and fruitfulness if I'm not doing that born out of a spirit of worship and a spirit of praise. Worship is not the warm-up act. I'll say that again. Worship is not the warm-up act. It's not what we do to kind of get in church mind so pastor can preach. Everything must be worship or nothing matters. If the Lord is not getting glory out of my life, if the Lord is not getting honor out of the way I live, if the Lord is not getting glory and honor out of our gathering together, then why do it? His is the glory, His is the power, His is the kingdom, forever and ever. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, He began with worship and He ended with worship. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Your name. That's worship. Your kingdom come, Your will be done. That's both worship and the, and the outflowing of that authority into the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then we get to need. Give us today 
our deedly bread. Then we get to repentance and regeneration. Forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. Now it's, now it's relational. First it's this relationship, now it's this relationship. Forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. Lead me not into temptation. Don't let me fight on Satan's battlefield. Let me fight on your battlefield. Let you choose the battle. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. And then back to worship. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever and ever. Worship is not an appendage to the Christian faith. Worship is not the warm-up act. Worship is the Christian faith. We exist to give glory and honor to God. So, it's, I think it's letter A in your, in, in your notes here on, under, under this. Yeah, To love God with all your heart is to worship. And just so you feel like we get through some things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill in these others for you real quickly, okay? Uh, to love your neighbor as yourself, letter B in your notes, this is ministry. This is service. And you cannot have ministry, you cannot have service without worship. Because here's what happens. Let me just, let me just, I didn't mean to go here, but here's what happens. If I serve Jesse, okay, but I'm not serving out of a heart that's been filled with worship, and serving us unto the Lord, then all of a sudden, I'm going to keep record of this service. Now it's not service. Now it's a favor. And you know what favors are. Favors are things we owe each other. You owe me a favor. So if I'm not in worship, but I'm trying to do ministry, then my source of strength comes from the affirmation I get from the ministry. Not from him. Did people think I preached well? Did people think the service was good? Did people uh, respond appropriately or accordingly to my acts of ministry? Let me just be really blunt. That's idolatry. I'm putting the people in the place of God. My sense of self, my sense of affirmation, my sense of purpose, my sense of fulfillment, all must come from Him so that I can do ministry without strings attached to you. Do you understand that? Because if you don't, I'm going to be here all year. (laughs) Does this make sense? Okay, so... Out of worship, then I can love my neighbor as myself because I'm not looking at what he's going to give me back. I'm just serving. I'm just serving. Because because the one who's going to take care of me isn't him. It's him. So so I don't don't put on him this this you owe me stuff. Okay? Because what will happen is if he sees Christ in me and the real ministry flowing out of me, he will respond to them. And then he'll go and do likewise with others. And and it grows. That's how ministry grows. Okay? So to love our neighbor as ourself is ministry. Then the Great Commission comes into place. And this is in your notes on the back of your handout. I'm actually going to fill in your whole handout for you today, or most of it. Okay, but to go and make disciples is evangelism. Now look at where this, how this flows, beloved. If I'm not with the Lord, okay then I'm not ministering in the right heart and in the right manner and in the right way. And if I can't minister to my neighbor as myself, notice how the Lord talks. It's the the neighbor. It's, It's that person I see. It's that person in front of me. If I can't minister to my neighbor as myself, what kind of evangelism will I have? Now, again, I'm, I'm statistically driven. I want, I, you know, and I'm, I'm in a denomination. I have to make reports and all that. And you start, you get, you get into this whole thing where we're driven by numbers and we're driven by, by statistics and we're driven by, by things where people are no longer people. They're no longer souls. They're commodities to be traded. That's not the kingdom of God. So to go into all the world To go and make disciples of all nations is born out of a heart that has fallen in love with God. And if I've fallen in love with God and I've fallen in love with humanity, then I must go. It's a a compulsion, but it's a holy compulsion. 
I mean, what kind of person looks at somebody who is about to go into a, a destructive place? What kind of person with the bridge is out up ahead and you know it? Just let cars keep going by. Because you don't want to offend the driver because you're slowing them down. Well, that's crazy. They're going to be really slowed down in a minute. They're going to be dead. My love for God and my love for people com must compel me to reach out to the lost. So to go and make disciples is evangelism. To baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. This is to incorporate them into fellowship. You once were lost, but now you're found. You once were dead, but now you're alive. The whole act of water baptism, the whole act of immersion is saying, I, I, it's a symbolic public gesture that says, I, I, I have been my own, I have died, I have been buried, and now I am resurrected in Christ. That's why we go under the water and come out. I'm living a new life in Christ. And I once, what I once was, I am no longer, which is why it must be public, too. It's a public testimony. You know, the, the whole idea of when, 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 when we give altar calls here, when I give an altar call, it's, it's, it tends to be private. It's not that I'm embarrassed, nor do I think that they, they don't need a public confession. They do. But for me, the public confession is water baptism, where people publicly confess their faith before God. And in India and other places, it's really scary. Because they have to, in certain states in India, you have to go before a magistrate to schedule the baptism. And people are there to persecute you. You are demonstrating that you are no longer Hindu or you are no longer Muslim. And now you are a Christian and a 2% minority. And you are persecuted. You are attacked, you are assaulted, you are arrested, you are all the things Jesus said you would be. But you're also no longer outside, you are in the family. And so baptism not, isn't just the act of, of immersion, it's the act of incorporation. And so in the body of Christ, we have to have a lot of things that build family. That say we're one, that say we're united, that say we're together. Some of those things are silly. You know, the Super Bowl party, the afternoon, there's a little plug, okay? For, <laughs> they're, they're kind of silly, but they're incorporation. They're getting the family together. They're getting the body together. Some of those things are much more serious. In the way we come to a prayer meeting every, every, every night at 6.30, there's a prayer meeting on campus. But these are fellowship things as well as spiritual things. But then to teach them, to train them, to disciple them, this is discipleship. Bringing people into the awareness and the following of the ways of Christ. Jesus said, teach them to observe everything I've taught you. Now, next Sunday, I'm going to talk about those three things in, in more detail, okay? This Sunday, I want to go to Luke 17, and I want to show you something. So go back to the screen that says worship, sister. I'm going to start in verse 1 just because I want to give you context, okay? Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to th be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Now why? Why? Because sin is the most destructive thing in the universe. Amen. I say that again. We have an undue tolerance of sin. We, it would be like tolerating cancer or coronary disease or anything else that is totally destructive to the human body. Sin is the most destructive force in the universe. So watch yourselves, Jesus said. Because it doesn't just destroy you, it never does. It goes around. Okay? It's contagious. It's a contagious disease, wickedness. 
And so within the body of Christ, you're supposed to love each other so much that you help each other in these areas of wickedness and righteousness. Not being your brother's judge, but being your brother's friend. Being your sister's friend. Caring one for another. So, the apostles, and then, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive me. Oh, I would be just like the apostles here. Verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. You know why? Because one time I'll forgive you, two times I'll forgive you, three times, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> And you get all the way up here. Now we got, we got problems. But this is how relationships are. See, Jesus is dealing with real human relationships. But he's dealing with it in the context of ministry this way. All right? To, to, to show the way that this works, he goes on. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it'll obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper? Get yourself ready and wait on me. While I eat and drink, after that you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. So let me pray. Father, give me the grace of your word today that I would say what only you're saying. Give each one in this room ears to hear, myself included, what you're saying. That we might grow in your grace and grow in your knowledge and grow in the depth that you've called us to. And for these things, I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Help us now in these few minutes before we go to your table. And I thank you for this in Christ's precious name. And all who agreed said together, amen. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire book of the Bible, or all of the books of the Bible, rather, speak to relationships. Relationships are difficult. If they weren't, it'd be easy. Okay, first two brothers, one killed the other, Cain and Abel. Relationships are difficult. Adam and Eve fell. Relationships are difficult. You have trial, tribulation, violence filling the land, so much so that God destroys the world in the book of Genesis because of, because of the violence in the land and the wickedness that's in the land. All throughout the Bible, you have this trial and difficulty of relationships, human relationships, the relationship a human being has with God, the relationship a human being has with his or her spouse, the relationship with children, the relationships one with another, the relationships within the family of God, the relationships within nations. I mean, this is, this is our way, okay? When Jesus talked about the, the end times, he, he said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. But, you know, in, in essence, he's saying this is just kind of the way you are. That's really not a sign unto itself. Now, kingdom rising against kingdom, nation against nation. Yeah, that's probably a sign. Or is a sign, rather. But the, the, the idea of, of human disenchantment, human di, uh, disenfranchisement, human digression, human... Pro- this, isn't a, this isn't a sign. This is humanity in its fallen condition. Okay? Christ comes to restore these things. Christ comes to make heaven heaven. He comes to the earth so that you and I have a little taste of what heaven looks like. And so he begins to restore broken relationships. He takes Simon the Zealot, okay, and recruits him as to one of the 12, along with Matthew, the tax collector. This, this makes Democrats and Republicans look like best friends. Okay, this, 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 is more, this is more socialist or communist almost and libertarian. I mean, this is way on the opposite ends of the spectrum. He brings them both in. They're sitting under the same tree. 
okay? They're, they're sleeping under the same stars. They're the same group of guys, okay? Then he brings, he brings Thomas, and Thomas is pretty analytical, and Thomas is pretty, uh, you know, kind of, he's probably from Missouri. Some of you will remember. He's, he's the show me guy, you know? He's, he's, you, you show me, show me. I, you know, I, I'm not buying anything you guys are saying. He needs to show me. Okay, that, that's Thomas. He's that kind of guy. Then you got Peter, and Peter's very impetuous, and Peter's very vocal, and Peter's, I don't know if he's as arrogant as much as he is just bold, you know, and he's, he's, just, he's just a bold guy, and, and, and all of his boldness is good. I mean, he's the only one that we know of outside of Jesus who's ever walked on water. That's pretty impressive, frankly, okay? He's also, you know, they'll all, they'll, they'll all run away, not me, I, you know. <laughs> I, am, I am a big, bad guy. I'm not running away. Yeah, you are, three times tonight, okay? So, so you've got all this group of guys, and, I, and I'm not even mentioning Judas, you know. And then you've got John, the youngest, and, and his brother James, and the sons of Zebedee. You know, James and John are, are pretty, pretty decent guys, it seems to be, and, and, and easy to get along with somewhat, if you like Sons of Thunder. But their mom's difficult. I mean, she's, she's, she's angling for positions of power, you know. I, that's, that's the 12. That's the sacred 12. Okay? It's hard to, it would be hard to build a Bible study, much less a church, around those 12 guys. They're as diverse and difficult and weird as, as anybody, okay? But what do they have in common? Jesus. Amen. Jesus. And what the Lord begins to do in them is teach them that it's the pursuit of him that, bears, that breaks down the barriers. It's the pursuit of him that brings commonality and purpose. It's the pursuit of him that brings about a sense of, 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 of not self-identity anymore, but identity with him. In fact, when you get to the book of Acts, when they look at Peter, James, and John, and the disciples, the, 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 the religious leaders say they took note that they had been with Jesus. Their self-identity no longer became as important as their corporate identity with Jesus. So you have Christ at the center. And so in all of these human relationships, in all of these things that Jesus starts talking about here, the, the, the brother that sins against you, and this difficulty, and that difficulty, and how do you interact with someone who has sinned against you, and how do you bring them into forgiveness? Oh, increase our faith. It's not that big a deal, is what he's saying. You're going to have faith this big and move stuff. It's not as hard as you're making it, in other words. You just have the focus wrong. If the focus is, get back to this illustration, if the focus is that Jesse has to get back to me what I've given to him, then the focus is wrong because what's going to happen, he's a human being. He will fail me. No offense. <laughs> and you will fail him. We will fail each other. The reason he says you got to ask somebody if they, think, if they come back to you seven times, is it's not the Lord saying, well, they're just taking advantage of you. It's the Lord saying, you guys are that broken. You'll foul up a lot more than you realize. And if you can't be merciful with the brokenness that you have, how can you grow at all? So this isn't, this isn't an issue of, of increase my faith, increase my grandeur, increase my, uh, you know, my ability to be, to be bigger than the moment and bigger than the... That's not, that's not the point. The point is, let's say you have a servant. And he's either plowing, working in the fields, or tending the flock. Now here it is, guys. That's the whole of the Lord's work. You are either working in the fields, rendering the harvest, or you're tending to the flock of God. You're either getting the lost outreach, or you're dealing with the church in reach. He just put the whole ministry out in front of you, and guess what they all are? Relationships. Let's say you have a servant who's working the fields or tending the flock. Ministry. He's working with Jesse or he's working with Jesse's buddies outside. Okay? And he's tired because ministry's tiring. 
Jesse wore him out. Jesse's friends wore him out. Weeching the lost wore him out. All that, all that stuff that we get, okay? He said, Jesus says, when, the, when you come in and the servant says, wow, I'm tired. Would you, the master of the house, say, hey, sit down, eat, relax, have a good time? No. No. What does he say? Prepare my meal. Wait on me. Then you may eat. Now think about this. It sounds almost harsh, particularly in a 21st century American mindset. But here's what the Lord is saying. You may be involved in all sorts of difficulties. You may be working, I'm picking on Jesse today. You may be working with Jesse and having to forgive him seven times today. And you're mad about it. And you're tired of it. And you want to just sit down and forget Jesse. And work on yourself. I'm going to eat. I'm going to do something for me. Because that kid's driving me up a wall. The Lord is saying, that's not the remedy. The remedy isn't ignoring him and taking care of yourself. The remedy is come to my table. Come into my presence. Prepare a meal of worship for me. Come into my presence. Feed at my table. Learn from me. Grow in me. And you will be restored in me. I'll even make a table before you in the presence of your enemies. But if you come to take care of yourself, you can't worship. But if you come to bless him, he'll take care of you. Too often, we have worked in the Lord's fields or we have tended the Lord's sheep and worn ourselves out because we've not prepared a meal for the Lord. We've not worshipped him. We've not entered his presence with praise, his courts with thanksgiving. We've not decided that we are going to honor the Lord and cultivate this most sacred of relationships. We've made it an appendage. We've made it an, a, a footnote. We've made it a warm-up act. We've made it a talent contest. We've made it a style contest. We've made it a thousand things that it's not. When the one thing that it is, is you, the Lord's servant, coming to the Lord and offering him you. Amen. I wish I had written that down, because you need to. It is you, the Lord's servant, coming to him and offering him you. That's how you got saved. And that's how you walk in grace. So if you need, I'm going to pick on Jesse again because I'm just having fun with it now. <laughs> if you need him to sing a certain way or play a certain way or do a certain thing or act a certain way, and that's the only time you can worship, then you're not worshiping at all. You, don't, you haven't a clue. Have you never heard on TV or, 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 or watched a, a performer sing a song and it just moved you? It wasn't a Christian song, it wasn't a holy song, it just moved you. You know why? Because it connected with you emotionally, it connected with you uh, in, in your mind, it connected with you in your memory, it connected with you on a lot of levels. And there are beautiful singers who can sing beautiful songs with wonderful lyrics and they move my, my soul, but not my spirit. There's a difference. And too many of us want our souls to be moved and our spirits are drying up. 
let me put it another way, because some people find those two terms redundant. Some people want our mind and emotions to be moved. When our spirit, that which has been given life by Christ, is drying up because we're not worshiping. And if I can't worship, then I can't minister. Not I won't, I can't. If I can't worship, I can't evangelize. Not I won't, I can't. If I can't worship, I won't fellowship. Not that I, no, I can't. I can't fellowship. I just, I just can't. I can't, I can't forgive. I'm going to pick on Tom now. I can't forgive Tom seven times if I've not been in the presence of Christ. Amen. Because that will annoy me too much. Your pastor gets annoyed easily. That would annoy me too much. I have to be in the presence of Christ. So when the Lord is saying this, he's talking not about just the sense of servant and who you are compared to him. He's talking about where does the servant get his food? I'm going to say that again. Where does the servant get his food? He's working in the master's fields, he's working with the master's flock, where does the servant get his food? From the master, exactly. He doesn't run down to McDonald's on his own dollar, he doesn't run down someplace else of his own money, he gets his from the master himself. So what is the master saying? He's saying, with the very gifts I give you, give that back to me, and what I will do is redeem it and give you something that is so much more strong, so much more delicious, so much more beautiful, so much more enriching, so much more nutritious than you could ever do on your own. Get the order right. Get the perspective right. So, if you're here today and you're struggling with this person, that person, this person, that person, my counsel to you is go to that person. In worship. Not in whining, not in complaining, in worship. Find the strength you need in his presence. Find the meal you need in his presence. Prepare a meal for the Lord. Prepare a meal of worship for the Lord. Give the Lord what he's already given to you. Give it back. I mean, this principle is across the board. We do it in offerings. We do it in tithing. We say stuff like, you know, give unto the Lord what is already his. And I mean that. And we mean that. When we say, you know, you tithe and you're giving 10%, we're not, we're not suggesting that you're giving God 10% of your money. God's allowing you to keep 90% of his money. It's all his. So when you sing a song to the Lord, it's not you singing unto the Lord a song that is your song. It is you singing back to the Lord his song. The most effective prayer isn't the prayer you've made up in your mind. Oh, I really need to ask God about this. The most effective prayer is the prayer that's flowing out of your spirit because it already came from his throne. Have you never had the burden to pray for something? That started with God. And he looks for the agreement on earth. And it goes back to him. That's how the ministry is supposed to flow. So again, I'm with the Lord. I'm offering him what he's already given to me. Then, out of that, I have a burden for this young man. And I reach out to him, not because of what he can give me or what he doesn't give me, but because the Lord has initiated this burden in my spirit. And suddenly the ministry flows with joy, with grace, with laughter, with fun. Amen. Not without burden, not without trial, not without tribulation. But I'm flowing in the grace of the Lord. As opposed to trying to initiate things on my own. You and I aren't called to initiate. We're called to respond. We respond to the initiation of the Holy Ghost. And he's given us instruction. It starts with worship, flows into ministry, 
reaches into evangelism, brings the body together and builds it up and then trains them to do the same thing. These are the instructions of the Lord. So we have his table today. Others have prepared the, the various elements in the natural. But what we can't do is prepare what this means. Only the Lord did that. My body. My blood, broken for you, shed for you, given for you. Now, you can take it just as a ritual, and I I can promise you it'll have very little meaning to you. Or, or, you can take it as a meal prepared by the Lord for you. And say, Lord, I'm going to offer this back to you. As I take this in, I want to I want to take you with me. This is symbolism, I understand that, but I'm I'm on I want to take your meal with me. You nourish me. You you give me strength. You give me nutrition. Give me grace for other people. Give me grace for those that that are annoying me today. Give me grace for those that are lost. Give me grace for those that are broken and wounded. Lord, let me take you with me just as I'm going to take this little piece of bread and this little piece of this little drink of the cup. I'm taking that with me in my body. Let me take you with me in my spirit. that happen? You worship. You recognize who he is. You recognize what he's done. You prepare the meal by preparing your heart to come into his presence. Amen. Stand with me, please.